It's Friday, Feedback Friday, the feedback day of the week. Ha, ah, it's Feedback Friday. Hey, third time's a charm recording this. My Windows decided to reset all my audio levels. Awesome. Thanks, Windows, so much. This is a much more, it's not driving into the red the whole time. Arr. Okay, so a lot of great feedback this week. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you guys are awesome. Uh, I'll do the, the, uh, helps with the channel stuff. And then I'll talk briefly because I got a lot of requests to talk about the Helena Taylor Bayonetta thing. I'll do that really quickly and then I'll get to your comments. Okay. So help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K or buy a one-time Leanna care session for someone who can use it, but can't afford it. Coffee.com slash Leanna K patrons this week got a chance to have their say and there, there's still time if you become a patron. Um, have their say in the development of an extension of Leanna Care stuff. I'm going to start doing some group, uh, group Zooms just for sort of socialization upon common interests. Um, uh, you know, moderated discussions so people can get that social time. Uh, it's such a simple concept, but it is structurally a bit of a challenge how to make it work so the patrons are getting their chance to have their say and sort of focus group it um now so now's a good time to become a patron uh and coffee there are a couple of leanna care session uh, leanna cares clients who would take sessions more frequently were it not for money so um any support you can give will help that out um, to me, that's ideal when people can, you know, pay a little bit and then get a top up because then they're serious about it. They're putting some skin in the game, but that, you know, they get the amount of attention they need. Um, but on to your comments. Um, like I said, they were really great and I couldn't pick out any great comments. So I picked some people who agreed with me, people who didn't agree with me, uh, and then people who just went their own way, which I love. I love when people just add. Um, so here we go. Uh, this one, the minute I read it, I'm like, yes, yes, this needs to go in because it's an exception that proves the rule. Yes, 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 absolutely. While I agree with you, this was on Monday's video about when men get hurt, I'm not sure about the anger thing for women. Mainly it's because I'm in the black community, but being a man, we but a man being weak is eaten alive. But a woman being angry isn't taken nearly the same. A lot of people will simply back down from that woman. Few will challenge her anger, even if some think she's an angry blankety blank blank. Many will give them the leeway if it's her period or a bad day or whatever. Men don't get that. Maybe I see it badly. Maybe it's just the black community that is that way, but it isn't the same there. And it, adding on to this, you can see a lot of it in the ang how anger of mother is treated. Like, for example, with children getting beat for not taking out the chicken to thaw memes. <laughs> I'll explain why I'm laughing. It's not because it's funny. It's just <laughs> that feel. Um, however, anger from a dad is treated as assault always. Then you have people who internalize this. You probably don't know this series, but it is a literature RPG book called The Land. The writer, who's black, often treats characters like how people are treated in the black community. If a woman or even a female dragon, dragonling is angry, there's a good reason because she's allowed to be because men. They're allowed to get away with things like attacking men with lightning, making the guy's contraception fail, and others. <sighs> But if a guy is angry, even if he is rightfully so, he's treated badly with one of the most common insults being about having a small penis. This isn't a one-off. It happens regularly in the book. It's written as jokes, but I've lived this and seen this. And yeah, like I said, this is the exception that proves the rule. There are reasons for that. Uh, one is that... Uh, Full disclosure, I grew up in a black neighborhood. You know, I spent a lot of time hanging out in houses. And, you know, it, it's sort of like back then it, it, there there was more of sort of a mixing of community than happens in the burbs. Um, and one of the struggles I have had as an adult is that very different socialization of how acceptable women's anger is. So the commenter is absolutely right that it is different and it is a real problem 
in terms of that, yes, th there's absolutely more threshold for female anger in communities. There are myriad reasons for that. I don't have time to get into them, so please don't feel like I'm glossing them over. They are not good historically. They just are. Um, and, I mean, part of it is that they're trying to toughen up their kids, especially their boys, but boys and girls in different ways because, you know, they want them to live to 30, for one, without being in prison. And that sucks. You know, you live in a West Indian household was code for expect it to be strict. Uh, and, you know, moms being primary caregivers all that all that burden all that intergenerational trauma it's very very real and the thing about men not being allowed to get angry is very very real as well and again that's just because there is a real double standard regarding black men and anger that's absolutely true and it's it's not fair it's so not fair and again these are these are very real exceptions and th this is when people say that the racialization of black people is just different you can't compare it to any other racial group that is true for this reason um yeah uh and like i said it's not right but it is true and and just because there are reasons for it doesn't mean that it's okay I did find that I, I, it was very tough for me to transition to sort of white media because that acceptance of aggression in women where I grew up was, was the threshold was so much higher. Now, I still get accused of being angry a lot when I'm not. Uh, unhinged is the other big one. Um, but you know it it is true and then you know when when you get out of the the black neighborhoods the black communities and into you know white predominantly white spaces everybody's read as too angry and it's not fair it's it's not fair internally in community it's not fair externally when people try to get upward social mobility. And that's why I read the comment. I think it's it's really important to talk about it. And in other settings, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to speak for black people. Uh, I'm just validating the experience here. And, and not all, obviously, not all. Um, but yeah. I think it was just important to give space to the comment because I can confirm I, I saw that. Uh, thank you so much, commenter. Uh, another person said, I appreciate the analysis of how letting hurt go unchecked leads to a variety of long term problems. Some bits that jumped out at me. Men expressing hurt puts people around men in a difficult situation. This is true not just because the built up hurt comes up too aggressively, but also because some people don't know how to respond. This can add to a man's anxiety about opening up. Don't treat people the way you don't want to be treated. Author Nassim Nicholas Taleb calls this the silver rule. Things shouldn't have to be the end of the world to matter. Great way to put it. This is a good goal for people learning to understand the emotions and have a proportional response. Also for someone trying to understand a friend with trouble expressing anger. And again, thank you for your comment. Um, uh, I had a great guest... Uh, not this last is not therapy, but the one before who talked about anxiety and anger and how to anger, anger, uh, anger people. Um, um, Bob was great. So go back and check out. It's episode 22 if you want to check it out. Uh, but yeah, um, things shouldn't have to be the end of the world to matter is one of my big mantras. And Part of that is because I don't reward the loudest mob gets the attention thinking. I think it's a race to the bottom. And 
that that is why I not not only say you know it shouldn't have to be the end of the world to matter. I I want to start addressing things when it's not the end of the world, right? Encourage that, but also I don't reward people who are um, grossly exaggerating. There's some exaggeration that's understandable because somebody's upset. Then there's exaggeration, you know, that whole, it's harmful, it's violence. Violence is violence, man. Do some comments increase the risk of violence and therefore are concerning? Yeah, that's a fair statement. Words are violence? Get away from me with that. Uh, interesting interesting propaganda position, not accurate. Uh, and the problem with the words or violence thing is that, you know, one of the things you try to do is teach people to use their words instead of getting violent. And if words are violence, well, what does that solve, right? And I do think it is very important because of that to set boundaries and reward people who can express themselves appropriately when they're angry. Now, a big part of that is to give people who have trouble expressing anger some signposts to do it more effectively. And I do think you need the combination of um, things don't have to be the end of the world to matter. Things don't have to be the worst thing ever to matter. You need that so that people feel like they will be rewarded for coming at you at, at, at like a four to a five instead of a nine to a 10 or an 11 or a 12, right? But then you do have to, and I end up doing this all the time, somebody coming at me aggressively isn't the end of the world. I will give them a chance, you know, unless they're, unless they're turf with, you know, shit in their, their Twitter bios. Um, but if somebody's just, they've been emotionally affected by something and they're coming in a bit hot, I'll be like, okay, I need you to take a step back. I'll talk to you, but I need you to take a step back. If they do it, awesome, right? Because that rewards the behavior we want to see. And I really appreciate it when people express things passionately. As long as they're being factual and not being abusive. And I'm, I'm really glad people responded to that because I think it's very important. Thank you for your comment. Um, I, I think maybe we need to talk about bottling up of emotions because it's something. I mean, I used to do it. I still do it to an extent. Um, and the next comment kind of explained why, even though I have never been in the military, but growing up in certain neighborhoods, it's got some similarities. So next comment. I was in the middle of watching this for the second time when I had an epiphany. The fact that anybody watches my videos a second time is just, I'm humbled. Um, in the U.S., we saw the rise of suck it up and be a man, starting with the boomers. I plotted out major conflicts that Americans were involved in versus the years of each generation. The first group of boomers started around 1946, right after World War II. The second group of boomers started in 1955, which was not long after the Korean War. Gen X was born right around the time of the Vietnam War. The millennials started being born about 1981. Both groups of boomers had parents that were involved in major wars, if not both World War II and Korea. Gen X was too young to fight in Vietnam, but those boomers did. If we do more than scratch the surface of typical male socialization, it's coming from fathers who likely suffered from PTSD. The biggest conflicts up until the global war on terror were World War II, Korean War, and the Vietnam War. How many men were socialized by fathers and sometimes mothers and fathers who were suffering from PTSD and not getting help for it? In wartime, when life has gone kinetic, you stuff everything down so you can fight your way through to survival. The thinking could very well have been, if it works in combat, it'll work just as well everywhere else. Spending most of my life with PTS made me realize what was going on. You disavow your emotions and go cold so you can get to tomorrow. Tomorrow might be better, it might not, but you won't see tomorrow if you can't survive. 
That's the common thread I see in male typical socialization. It sucks, but if you don't know any method, it works. And yeah, um, spot on. I've talked before about um, masculine norms, modern masculine norms really being embedded in World War II. And this commenters tracked the same progression. Now, the one thing I will add is that you know, people my family's generation had this weird, um, they were raised by fathers and mothers in some cases with PTS, men from the, men from combat, women from, you know, some really rough years my uh, you know my grandparents survived the depression and i mean that's the other major trauma pre pre world war 2 right and so then you've got their children who were the you know sort of the vietnam era um or just slightly too young to be in vietnam and they had a bitterness about them because that was the go to college and get a good job and because of the recession in the 80s that was the first time college educated men were laid off in in large portions they couldn't find work certainly not college educated work that is the subtext of the original ghostbusters movie they're academics who who get laid off vankman deserved to be fired um and have to put on overalls that was a big metaphor for what was going on in the 80s. And that led to its own bitterness. Now, that is not that, that the reason I say bitterness and not trauma there is that is not the trauma of that get through it to survive. They're finding similar things in neighborhoods like I grew up in that were plagued by a lot of violence and poverty. You're seeing trauma symptoms in 15, 16, 17 year olds, right? And because it's so widespread, it's not, it's not being dealt with properly. It's not being diagnosed for what it is. They're behavior problems instead of traumatized. And um, the comments really apt. I do think that even if you weren't raised directly by a veteran, there is still that intergenerational trauma. Um, and some ways, the bitterness of that next generation messed up their kids even more than the, uh, the people who'd seen war. And it is true. I mean, when I did the piece on gaming technology and, and PTSD treatment, uh, there, one of the things the people I interviewed told me is they you know, they, they did simulations for Iraq and Afghanistan, but they were trying to get funding for a Vietnam sim because, you know, guys who were in that war, and they were fairly old, were coming to them saying, I don't want to live with this anymore. I'm tired of carrying this. And part of the reason I speak openly about, you know, my trauma therapy, if you watch Wellness Wednesday, I really got into it there, is because I do think that people have to be able to talk about that. People have to be able to disclose that background without people thinking, oh, you're just going to go postal and kill everyone. Because that's the other thing that happens to veterans, right? Thank you for your service. Now fuck off, psycho. It's not right. It's not right. And we need to normalize people living with those, li living with PTS and having, you know, become asymptomatic from PTS, doing the work because you can't get your life back if you can't get a job. And that assumption is just so angering. Again, going to keep talking about this. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. I, I do I do think that a uh, video specifically for men about uh, validating feelings um, is something I'm going to do in future because uh, I'm making notes as I talk because um, one of the things I found with workbooks and traditional uh, CBT and DBD th therapy is the language is very feminized and 
men aren't going to feel better if they feel emasculated, period, end of story. Just doesn't work. Okay. Um, this was an interesting comment too. I think many of the problems around this issue stem from the socialization metric of men act, women are acted upon. Oh, this theory. Yep. Bracing myself. Okay. Not because I disagree with the comment, because, oh, I hate this. I This is taught in women's studies. It is, oh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? When a woman has an emotional reaction, it's because something has happened to her, and thus her reaction is justified. This extends to the point where literally any reaction, no matter how absurd or over the top, can be written off. As an example, when a man hits a woman, it is universally bad, as it should be. But when a woman hits a man, it can only be because the man has done something to make her snap and lash out. The default reaction to her expression of anger manifesting to physical violence is still seen as not her fault. When a man has an emotional reaction to a situation, it's because he has done something to cause his own reaction. The onus is ultimately on him. He is innately to blame for his own emotions relating to said situation, and thus his reaction is considered self-inflicted and rarely has justification for burdening others with it. We are dragged for not opening up more to our partners, but then shamed for doing so, because ultimately it was our fault for having felt that way. Even worse, now we are being told that wanting someone to open up to or to help us figure out the emotional states that have been either beaten or shamed from us from early childhood is inflicting onto emotional labor on our partners and is now yet another metric of sexist depression. Combine this with the vilification of male spaces where men would have some outlet for these pent up feelings and you're left with a pretty bleak outlook. Um, and it goes on... Um, you know, okay, I'll, I'll do a bit more. Uh, there's a lot already there. Men are blamed for experiencing their own emotions and men are blamed or shamed for trying to share their emotions. Then men are vilified to try to make up space for themselves to cope with their emotions. When it all comes to a head and men start to snap, mostly resulting in suicide, they're blamed and shamed again. It was obviously his toxic masculinity that caused him to bottle all up for so long. The comment goes on from there and I wanted to read um, more, but... Um, I want to address this because there's a lot of validity in this. This is my I'm like, oh, the men act, women are acted upon. And I'm like, brace myself because, yeah. Um, the one thing I will add is despite the rhetoric, women gaslight other women on emotions all the time. You're making a big, too big deal out of it. Just don't let it bother you, you know, Despite all the so-called feminist rhetoric, when the truth is that, yes, some women do blame men, but those same women do it to other women as well. Uh, they may say it's because you're a man, but they do the exact same thing to other women. The whole queen bee syndrome. They just find other excuses. Women are fucking awful to other women. And that, that's not to say the commenter's wrong in their observations. Uh, it's just the justification, not the, not, the, not the motivation for it. It's still absolutely correct the way they've described, you know, drag for not opening up, but then shamed when they do. And the other side to that stereotype is this idea and this is why I cannot stand complementary and gender ideology or the idea of a sex-based right um but uh women are not just naturally gifted in emotional communication there are certain baselines that the typical woman has but a lot of it is what you're allowed and encouraged to do as a child. And I think that th there's been a lot of books written on how god awful women are to each other. Rachel Simmons' Odd Girl Out is the one I, I recommend. But uh, no, women don't have some magic sixth sense when it comes to feelings and compassion. That's just not true. It's a myth. It's a stereotype. 
Uh, and a lot of women, I think, secretly resent being forced into that box. Um, I wish I could say more. Maybe I can unpack this. I don't know. Do you want this unpacked more? This men act, women are acted upon. Make a note of that. Um, for future Manly Monday, because, yeah, Ah, moving on. Um, interesting learning about this topic. I can relate to emotional repression and not letting people see them. Then I end up letting them out in the shower when going to bed. Unfortunately, since I'm female, the emotions will just like suddenly spring up to be visible on the surface. They cite, um, you know, estradiol being at peak before ovulation. So I end up lashing out for upsetting people. I feel more tired, fall on the ground, that I feel like a useless piece of garbage for a few days because of stuff I legit can't control, making me unable to get homework done and end up feeling burnt out. Uh, therapist helped me figure out counter strategies, but it's so hard. Okay. Yes, we are internalized that it is those female emotions that make us do that. And that's not true for everyone. If you're getting symptoms that bad, there may be a hormone imbalance that can't you can't get some help with um but also this is true for everybody if there are points in the week or the month or the year that you have to slow down so you don't become a disaster your environment should support that so you can be at your best because you're not at your best if you fall apart and are useless for a few days on the regular and this is true for everybody. Everybody has their moments, you know, when when there's a an event of a bad memory or something's really tough. It's better to slow down to go faster long term. So hopefully your therapist there can help you learn to set boundaries and set a schedule where you're not breaking down. Um that's some of the work I do with Leanna Cares. I'm running out of time and I want to get, I had one more comment, but some people, oh, I can't even do the Snape comment. Oh, the Snape comment was so good. Um, I don't want to ignore the criticism people leveled at me about Jordan Peterson. Um, because I think that there's a misunderstanding here in part. And if some people are thinking it and saying it, other people probably thought it and didn't say it. So, you know, this is, it's amazing when people say she only responds to people who kiss her ass. She doesn't respond to criticism, no matter how many times I do it. But um, even though these people, some of these people are angry at me and I believe unfair, they did it in a respectful way. And again, I want to reward that. So here are two comments. Um... Dr. Peterson's lessons are about personal accountability to yourself and to society around you. This is reflected in his behavior reflects this. He is calm and always thoughtful with his words. The only times he becomes something other than calm and reserved is when he has strong feelings about something. The fact that he cries about incels and the issues surrounding them shows the depth of his concern and emotional response. And the fact that Leanna separates him in pieces like suggests that she's not integrating her analysis and criticism of him as a whole person. So he's totally always calm, even when he's not. Or he's calm and always thoughtful, except for the times he's not calm and reserved and thoughtful. Stick a pin in that, I'll come back to it. Even if someone has a serious mental health concern, that doesn't mean they should be dismissed on everything based on that quote. How does that spare with how... How does that square with how you dismiss Jordan Peterson? You regularly dismiss what he says on the basis of him being brain damaged. Um... That's taking my comment somewhat out of context, no surprise. Uh, but I don't think it was done deliberately. I think these are emotional responses because people feel defensive of him. My dismissal of his, my dismissal is that he says one thing, he does another. He preaches control and personal accountability. He didn't say incels. To correct, he said awkward young men. The interviewer said incels. He pivoted to awkward young men. And he referred to awkward young men as a marginalized group. 
that isn't accountable, that isn't being accountable to society around you. Being awkward and being marginalized aren't the same thing. Do awkward, young, white, straight, cisgender men struggle? Absolutely. But to call that group marginalized it doesn't understand the concept of marginalization. And this is what I'm talking about. Like, when he says stuff like that, he feeds that everything has to be the worst thing ever to matter. His, he doesn't follow his own prescriptions, his own rules for life. And that is not dismissing everything he says. That is dismissing that part of him. And I dismiss that. Because of the impact he has on the first, the first commenter, the thing I stuck a pin in. His behavior, he is calm and always thoughtful with his words. The only time he becomes something other than calm and reserved is when he has strong feelings about something. Which is it? You can have strong feelings about something and not break down into tears and shake at a debate. If you go back and look at his performance on that, uh, was it the Monk debate? The one that Stephen Fry was on? I mean, that whole thing was a shit show. Michelle Goldberg was so intimidated by him, she shit the bed as well. But Stephen Fry was really the only one that brought anything to the table. That was just... Weiss. But he was trembling. And that's not someone who is in control. And someone who is truly personally accountable has that experience and says, I got to get it together. Somebody who is personally accountable doesn't try to quit benzos cold turkey, especially someone in psychology who knows what that does. He can preach personal accountability all he wants. But he's not living as somebody who's accountable. He doesn't even really take accountability for what he says. He always claims that he was just quoting someone else. Not always, but a lot of the time. Like, you got to be accountable when you drop the term enforced monogamy to the New York Times. When I say something I know is going to be contentious, which is part of the reason I'm addressing these critics, I know some people are going to feel strongly about Jordan Peterson. I'm not going to act shocked when people do. Same thing. When you drop a term like enforced monogamy to the New York Times, it's not accountable to play the victim afterwards. And actions tend to speak louder than words. And that was before the coma. Okay. But again, you don't dismiss him on everything because he has brain damage. The reality is he now has brain damage and anybody who has dealt with someone like that knows sometimes they do lose um, uh, certain emotional control. Now, the thing is, he never had it beforehand. But you got to ask yourself, can you really take lessons in personal accountability from someone who never owns what they say, always says they were misunderstood or misquoted by lesser minds, um, created such intense protests at University of Toronto that he had to stop seeing one-on-one -on -one clients for therapy because they had to walk through protest lines to attend their appointments. Um, didn't admit when all the doom and gloom scenarios, including the claim that he was going to be thrown in jail, never came to pass. And then did something incredibly reckless with a psychiatric medication that he as a psychologist knew you can't just quit cold turkey. Doctor shopped because nobody was, nobody was giving him what he wanted. Ends up in a coma in Russia 
almost dies. His daughter says he has brain damage. And then he's right back at it. No taking stock. No owning what happened. That is not a role model for personal accountability. And I stand by the fact. See, this isn't me dismissing what he did. This is me pointing out. He says this. He does this. When someone show you, shows you who they are, believe them. And I am very... Like, he's dispensing wisdom but you only take wisdom from people whose lives seem good to you and the fact that he has encouraged such double think about emotions in his defenders the fact that somebody can say this is reflected in his behavior and reflects this he is calm and always thoughtful with his words the only time he becomes something other than calm and reserved is when he has strong feelings about something That's his impact. Because he's not teaching that you can feel strongly about something and stay emotionally regulated. And that, that is the truth. There's a way to be passionate about something. I do it all the time. I go hard on things. And I get accused of being unhinged and triggered. And all that. I'm not. I'm just expressing myself forcefully. He's not giving people the good juice he's not giving people the actual tools to be able to speak passionately about things and emotionally regulate because he doesn't know how to do it and everything everything is based on control and it's really easy to lecture other people on personal accountability but you lose all ability to be considered an expert in that when you don't display it yourself. And that's why I respond to critics. That's why I admit when I see that I'm wrong. You can't have it both ways. And that's why I stand by. This is not me dismissing him. This is me taking the summary of everything on its own, 12 Rules for Life is unobjectionable. Maps of Meaning is just dense. I forget the one he wrote in between. But it's the, the, the walk does not match the talk. And that matters. And that's not dismissing him. That's challenging him. And somebody who truly understands personal accountability understands that. I don't think I'd have swayed, I don't think I've swayed these commenters at all. But like I said, some people probably thought it and didn't comment, so that response was for them. All right, help support this channel. Become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K, or buy a one-time Leanna Care session for someone who can use it but can't afford it, coffee.com slash Leanna K. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.